now. It's good morning to our political commentator, Colin James, who must have met some... Must have met some trustworthy politician, politicians at some stage <laughs> in his career, I'm sure. Hello, Colin. Sure, Rachel, uh, and, and I remember a book called Bullshit and Jelly Beans, and I think I've still got it on my bookshelf, and I'm not sure which we were hearing just then, but it's certainly uh, a, a, an engaging character, and one that's actually got... Mu uh, beneath the humour, there is something quite uh, um, substantial in Tim Shelburne. Indeed. Right. Well, let's sashay now on to uh, Peter Dunn. Because, sashay to Peter Dunn. Yes, no. from Tim Shadbolt. But, um, you know, we mm. saw, heard some of his frustrations on a number of issues, actually, this morning when we spoke mm. to him earlier, chiefly about re-registering uh, his party. Is the Electoral Commission being, you know, obstructive and a bit fusty here? Uh, the short answer is yes, but the long answer is that the Commission went through this and decided on a set of rules back in 2011 and then says that it can't change those rules just for one party. Uh, that shouldn't do it speciously. Now, there's an argument, I think, for revisiting the rules as a whole. But the point of sticking to rules uh, is uh, that uh, there's money involved, taxpayers' money, and also it's, uh, elections are at the heart of our democracy. So rules should be changed carefully, I think. Should Peter Dunn expect a return to a ministry, well, or even Parliament? <laughs> well, the short answer is no to the ministry, and a slightly longer but still short answer is, is no to Parliament. But uh, he makes a case uh, that there is... There are people do feel there's a space for his party, but he only, that party only got 0.6% in the 2011 election. So I don't think this, he's made the space big enough to say, I really deserve to return to Parliament. But I learnt a long time ago that you never say never in politics. So we just have to watch and see. Certainly he was feisty in that interview. Uh, I think perhaps it's a bit of a reaction to the really bad uh, times he's been having, but mm. there was a feistiness there. That, uh, Indeed. OK, we also touched on this morning the Employment Relations Amendment Bill. Why is it a private member's bill and not a government bill? Well, I think uh, governments, uh, it, it's there with the endorsement of the caucus. Uh, as something that they can try out. And governments do this. Backbenchers will bring forward a bill that goes a bit further than government policy to test it. And I think that's what's been done in this case. It's not included in a bill that uh, Simon Bridges is putting through, which makes sweeping changes uh, to multi-employer contracts, to contracting, to the, what you have to do and by way of good faith, and a number of other things, quite big changes to uh, employment law. So this is just an additional bit. Uh, and interestingly enough, as you pointed out, the employer, Employers and Manufacturers Association, doubtful about it. They talked about it being mm. divisive and also potentially uh, being seen by New Zealand as unfair. And I noticed that Jamie Lee Ross drew back on the inclusion of lockouts. So you can lock people out and then put other people in there in their place. And he, he seemed to be drawing back on that in your Yeah, there's a bit of a distinction there. OK, um, we're a week out from a by-election in Ekarabarafati. What, what is at stake here for David Shearer? Well, first of all, he's been doing a lot of campaigning. So if they don't do very well, that will have a direct uh, impact back on him. People will see him as not having done well enough because he's nailed himself to that uh, by-election mast. Uh, secondly, there's a deeper issue here, and, and that is that uh, Labor hasn't worked out yet since it lost its first seat to uh, uh, Tohanery back in 1993, has not worked out uh, uh, we reworked its relationship with the Māori seats and the Māori voters as such. It's gone up and down uh, and uh, uh, it's got to do that. It knows it's got to do that and partly that's to get candidates who are A, able and B, have rank and standing. And it hasn't been succeeding in doing that, I think, for 40 or 50 years. So yeah. there's a deeper issue here besides David Shearer. But, and okay. especially, especially if they lost the seat, yes. I think it would the, the party would be in paroxysms, I think. Very briefly, uh, we saw in our report Peter Sharples defend his party's relationship with National when he spoke out about how you know, his party's changed National and that National has endorsed them mm. in this Māori seat. So what do we take from that? Has the Māori well, Party become sort of the de facto National, <laughs> national Party well, in Māori seats in a way? Well, it is. It, it, not de facto so much as proxy. And Bill English made this point actually quite some years ago, that looking ahead at the demographics in New Zealand, the National Party needs brown votes. That's Polynesian and Māori. Uh, and one of the ways of doing that has been to uh, bring the Māori Party into the, co the governing arrangement. Now, the interesting thing about that is the Māori Party now actually votes against the government uh, more often than it votes with it, except on issues where it's bound to by the, by the agreement. So it's, it's a pr difficult proxy arrangement, plus... It might well be after the next election that the, the National Party needs the Māori Party to get to 61 seats, so who knows. All right, Colin James, appreciate your analysis this morning. Thank you.